Now the next thing we're going to do is fractions. And fractions tend to be one of the things that students have the most difficulty with, primarily because they're not familiar with them. And they look intimidating when you write a lot of fractions out. But fractions are really no different than whole numbers. They're just a whole number broken into pieces. We can still only add, subtract, multiply, and divide. But unlike whole numbers, fractions come in several different forms. We could say three, basically, and they are not large, medium, and small, nor good, bad, and ugly. We have three types of fractions. One of them is this type. It's called a proper fraction. Okay, and then we have an improper fraction, and we also have another one called a mixed number. A proper fraction, okay, we have a fraction, we'll say one-fourth. Well, the top number in a fraction is called the numerator. The bottom one is called a denominator. And these are very important that you know these terms because what we're going to refer to when we're doing this is the numerator and the denominator. Well, the numerator shows the number of parts and the denominator shows the whole. So I have one of four parts and this is a proper fraction and the proper fraction is defined the numerator is less than the denominator. So this is less than this so that's a proper fraction. An improper fraction turns to be the reverse. We have something like this. The numerator is greater than the denominator, so that's called an improper fraction. So what we have here is a case where we have three, if three would be a whole, we have actually more than a whole. Now this is one way of expressing this. Another way is there's a mixed number, and a mixed number and an improper fraction are two ways of expressing the same value. So how would I do this as a mixed number? Well, a mixed number always has a whole number and then a fractional component, and it should have the fractional component always as a proper fraction. Sometimes you'll see them as improper fraction, which creates a little more difficulty, but not something to be too worried about. Okay, so three goes and we're going to do this when we want to solve this as a mixed number. Well, what you do is you divide the numerator by the denominator. So we take eight and we divide it by three. Well, three goes into eight. Two times three is six. I'll make that look like an eight. Okay, two times three is six, and I have two left over. So now I have two and two thirds. What we do is we keep the whole number, we take the remainder, put it over that denominator, over that divisor, and makes it two and two thirds. Two and two thirds and eight thirds are the same thing. Just two different ways of writing the same number. Eight thirds equals two and two-thirds. Two different ways of representing the same fraction. Now the key to understanding fractions is this, the denominator. It tells you all about the fraction, okay? We know that this is, this is two and two-thirds. How do I know that's eight-thirds? Well, what we do is we multiply that denominator by the whole number. What's two times three? It's six. Add the numerator, which is two. That gives me eight. I have eight-thirds. We write it this way rather than writing it a way it could be written. If I wrote a number like this, say uh, five and uh, three fourths, okay, I could write it this way. I could write four fourths plus 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 three fourths. I have this number, 4 divided into 4 because this line represents division. This gives me 1. Any number over itself in a fraction represents 1. So 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 3 fourths. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 3 fourths. I have 5 and 3 fourths. We write it this way in order to avoid writing it this way. But they actually have the same value and the same meaning. It's just a shorthand for writing a group of fractions, okay? So understanding that that's how you would write the three different types of fractions, we can go on and do some manipulation with them. Well, now we're gonna start off with the first operation with fractions, which is adding fractions. So let's take two fractions and add them. Well, 
Well, this is relatively easy because you have a common denominator and you just add the two numerators and we end up with five sevenths. Okay, but what happens if you're adding them and you do not have a common denominator? Say, for example, we change this one from two sevenths to three fifths. Now we come up with a whole different problem because now we can't just add them together and get the same, the proper number. One of the things we have to do is learn the way of finding the lowest common denominator. When you get into a class, instructors will show you several ways, even any of the textbooks you use will show you several ways of achieving the lowest common denominator. That means it's a number that both the denominators will divide into evenly. One of the hints you want to know is it's always going to be a multiple of the largest one. It's going to be a multiple of seven. So we're trying to figure what number would be the first number that five and seven would divide into evenly. Well, what you can do is you could go through seven times one, seven times two, seven times three, three times one, five, five times one, five times two, five times three, until you got the list exhausted. That's a waste of your time. One of the easiest ways is what we call prime factoring. Now prime factoring refers to prime numbers. All numbers are either prime numbers or composite numbers. The prime numbers are the numbers that are only divisible by one in themselves. These two turn out to both be prime numbers because the only numbers that divide evenly into seven are seven and one. The only numbers that divide evenly into five are five and one. So these are both prime numbers. Other than two, which is the only even prime number, no even number after two is a prime number, all the even numbers turn out to be, guess what, odd numbers. So that's easy to see if you have a prime number or not. If it's other than two and it's even, it's never prime. But the prime numbers are more difficult to find because they don't follow any pattern. They are sometimes difficult to perceive because you're not sure when you get a large one if that's prime or not. You have to check it out to see if there's any other divisors. But one of the hints you can find all prime numbers in in one, three, seven, or nine. After you get through with the even number of two, any prime number will end in one of those three. The others, you can't two, four, six, or five, six, or eight, okay? You cannot divide those, I mean, you can those divided by other numbers, two, four, five, six, and eight. These are all even numbers. The five is not, but any number that ends in five is divisible by five. So if you have 25, it's divisible by what? Five, and by one, and by 25. So it cannot be a prime number. So that's one thing you have to get used to the fact, and that'll be explained to you more in detail when you get into class, the difference. And prime numbers are very handy. They allow us to do a lot of math we couldn't do easily otherwise. So five and seven, what would be the lowest common denominator? One way is to do this, is to take and multiply the two together. That gives me, gives me 35, okay? 35 and then 35. Then what you have to do is convert these into improper frac or into um, equivalent fractions, which means the fractions is the same value, but it looks different. You just divide the old denominator. Seven goes to 35 five times, multiply it by the numerator. That gives me 10. Five goes to 35 seven times, three times seven is 21. And what do I get? I get a total of 31 35ths, and that's my answer. So when we add fractions, we have to find your lowest common denominator. Sometimes you may have mixed numbers, like for example, two and three eighths plus seven and one fourth. The easy way to do this, although there's several methods of doing it, is to take the two whole numbers and set them aside. Two and seven gives me nine. And then just add the two fractions together. Well, eight and four, the lowest common denominator is going to be eight. One of the tricks you want to look to or look for when you do this is to look and see what is the largest denominator and then see if the other denominator will divide into it evenly. If they will, then it turns out to be that that would be the largest, lowest common denominator. Excuse me. 8 and 8, again, convert them into equivalent fractions. 8 goes into 8 once. 1 times 3 is 3. This one didn't change value. 4 goes into 8 2 times. 2 times 1 is 2. That gives us 2 and 3 is 5 eighths. We add that to the number. Voila, we have our answer to that problem, okay? So one of the things you have to remember is you have to find the lowest common denominator adding and subtracting fractions. Now, subtracting fractions is just the same as subtracting whole numbers, but we have a little bit of a problem. We have, sometimes we have to learn how to borrow. So if you have, for example, 
seven and one fourth minus two and three fourths, I have a little bit of a problem. I cannot subtract a larger number from a smaller number. Three fourths is larger than one fourth, so I have to come up with a way of getting this fraction to become larger. And what we do is we borrow one from we borrow a fraction that's equivalent to one. The only kind of fraction equivalent to one is a number over itself. Remember when we did the demonstration <clears throat> showing that, that was, the whole numbers are repeated of that fractional part? Well, we do the same thing here. So we take, okay, we're going to have to borrow one from here. So we borrow a whole number from this one, but a whole number actually is a fraction. So this becomes six. And this, remember I told you, was the key. So that seven is four fourths seven times. So we borrow four fourths. Six and four fourths plus the fraction fourths. And now I get six and five fourths minus two and three fourths. So now what we do is we subtract the three from the five, which gives me two fourths. And we subtract the two from the six, which gives me four. Four and two fourths, and I can reduce this fraction down because any time you have a fraction that has two even numbers, they can be reduced. So if we divide them both by two, divide them both by two, this becomes one, this becomes two, and I now have four and one half, and that's the answer to that subtraction problem. There's a couple other ways you can do this, but we won't get into that now. The thing is, you have to remember in fractions, you may have to borrow. Any time you have a smaller fraction above, you're going to have to borrow something to make that become a larger fraction. And that's the key when you're subtracting fractions.